what do you think has been the worst decision of RBI in the history? I would say demonetization comes close to decisions, but it wasn't the RBI, it was a decision it was asked to take. The feeling was that if we demonetize, a lot of people will declare their black money. Exactly. And we'll get so much more in taxes. Mm -hmm. I don't think it happened at all. How do we decide who will be on the face of note? In India, we have Mahatma Gandhi ji, but there's no one else. We can't agree on anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can tamper with the color, you can tamper with the size, but you can't tamper with the face. Because once you pick a face, it becomes very, very controversial. What is the basic salary of an RBI governor and what are the perks you get? It used to be 4 lakhs a year. 4 lakhs a year? The biggest perk is the house. I, you know, did a calculation at one point. If we sold the house, we'd get about 450 crores. Who do you think was the best finance minister of India? I think... Today, we got one of the biggest guests of 2023 on Figuring Out, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, the ex-RBI governor. Matlab, technically, in which there is control in which this country will come, how many currencies will come or not come, how many notes will be printed and every note will be signed. That person we got here. It's an honor to have conversation with one of the leading economists in the world and India's ex-RBI governor. We tried to understand from him ki superpower banne ke liye hume chahiye kya hota hai. What does India need in order to become the world leader? How can you and I become a part of this growing economy and actually create a lot of opportunities for ourselves? Why did government ban 2000 rupee note? What does it mean to do demonetization in the country? And RBI ke worst decisions kya hai, best decisions kya hai, in sab ke baare hain baat kari, in all, we have tried to understand a country kaise apne aap ko powerful banati hai and what is the role of a citizen in it. Please try to watch this episode till the end because this is one of the best episodes and one of the most deep episodes we have done on figuring out and and and. Go subscribe Rajshamani Clips and Rajshamani Shorts channel because there we try to bring small clips of this huge podcast to help you become a better leader and understand our country in a better way in just small amount of time. Enjoy the show. Okay. Sir, it's our pleasure. Thank you so much for coming here all the way. And I still can't believe that we have the opportunity to speak to you in just one and a half years of our journey. So you can see the excitement on my face, right? Well, thank you very much for having me. It's such a pleasure being here with you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, in basic terms, in uh, basic audience, ko, can you tell us what RBI governor's role is? Like, what RBI governor does? We sit in the office mein hai, <laughs> aur, uh, files and read files. But... Basic role is that the mudra, hai, uh, currency, hmm. you have to maintain its value. Okay. How do you maintain its value? You ensure, one, you don't print too much of it. Two, you print as much as the economy needs. Uh, three, uh, you try and build confidence over time by keeping inflation low. Hmm. Because... Uh, पैसे का मूल्य इसलिए घटता है क्योंकि महंगाई बढ़ती है तो यू ट्राई एंड कीप इन्फ्लेशन कंट्रोल्ड एंड फॉर दैट यू डू अ होल बंच ऑफ थिंग्स यू रेज इंटरेस्ट रेट सो एज टू कीप पीपल फ्रॉम बोरोइंग टू मच फ्रॉम स्पेंडिंग टू मच सो यू थिंक ऑफ इट एज अ कंट्रोलर यू आर ट्राइंग टू कंट्रोल द इकोनमी सो एज टू कीप द वैल्यू ऑफ मनी विद इन अ a narrow range. So I have two questions on this. Like you said, it's about controlling how much to print so that you can keep an economy growing and in a healthy state, right? How does a country or RBI understand that how many notes to print, how many currency to print, how to regulate it? Like, yeah. is there some process in simple, obviously there is, but in simple words, we can understand. How do we decide? How much to print a note? If, let's say, if RBI governor says, kar do, to, can you do it? No, so uh, <coughs> you can, but there is a process. Hmm. Um, uh, uh, 
when we talk about money it's not just notes hmm. it's also what are called reserves okay reserves are like deposits that the banks hold with the cent- with the rbi so when you are talking about expanding the money supply you can do it in two ways you can print more notes and you can create more reserves hmm. and typically we do a little bit of both but the biggest way we expand money is by expanding reserves hmm. now what we have is typically an estimate of how much reserve growth we will have in a year okay. and we try and stick by that now kabhi kabhi aisa hota hai ki desh mein dollars aa jate hain and to keep the rupee from depreciating uh what we have to do is uh you know uh, buy up the dollars okay and that will mean that we also increase the pace at which we issue reserves you can go into the details but it turns out when you buy the dollars you're buying them from the banks and you're paying them as a central bank with reserves hmm. so their holding of reserves also goes up and yeah. so then you say acha we've spent we've created more reserves now we have to slow down hmm. in the rest of the year to meet our target that is how we do it got it so now in this uh, let's try to understand you said dollars coming in so mm. i have a question but before that i have to preset mm. how do economies grow like be- that's your one of the first uh, chapters as well by yeah. the way and like is economy growing everything to become a superpower right so this book is aimed at a ordinary audience hmm. uh, who's not an eco- economist so if you want to understand how economies grow hmm. simplest way to understand how economies grow is saying everybody produces more hmm jaise aap podcast bana rahe hain so if you make three prop podcasts a week rather than one podcast a week you're producing more yeah hopefully <laughs> as many people listen to three podcasts as one right. but you are creating more uh, supply and so to the extent that you're doing more the economy grows more people think in terms of goods you're producing producing more pens jo aapke haath mein hai more more uh, mics you know, more clothes more mics more clothes how do you do that however you do that typically in two or three ways you put more people to work rozgari badhti hai to hmm. you'll uh, produce more second you will have each of those people working more efficiently they can work more efficiently because they learn how to work better or they use tools hmm. right so if you were you don't have this mic and this uh, ability to record and ability to send over the internet your podcast would be heard by four people in this room True. that's it today you can reach millions because you have this capital associated with your you 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 your speech is transformed by the capital to reach so many so uh, capital is something else which increases uh, productivity so more labor more capital and doing things more cleverly more efficiently these are the three ways you increase uh, uh, productivity and you increase gdp growth aapne last sawal sawal ye pucha ki super power ban ke kya karenge i think there are many notions of super power one hmm. is you become a developed nation hmm. if we become a developed nation aur hamara per capita gdp hai 2500 dollars hmm. yani ki ek saal mein har aadmi ko 2500 dollars milte hain as i uh, income for a developed country it's about 50000 dollars yani ki 20 guna hmm how do we get there if we get there if every indian earns 50000 dollars we will be you know multiply by 1.4 billion indians we will be a 75 trillion dollar economy which is four times the size of the us today yeah. right so if we get there it's a long way from yeah. here to there uh, but uh, quick question again what do you think has been the worst decision of rbi in the history that's uh, look according uh, to you just yeah, uh, no no uh, you want to be careful about decisions by the rbi 
and decisions that the government asks the RBI to take. And and sometimes the RBI has to follow the uh, decisions that that are it's asked of the ruling to. government. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, you know specific decisions, I would say demonetization comes close to decisions, but it wasn't the RBI. It was a decision it was asked to take because it created a lot of hardship for people. Um, but that's in my memory. Uh, I mean, they. There are other decisions that the RBI was asked to take at certain times, which you know were again with in consultation with government devaluing the rupee in the 60s. Um, it was necessary because we were losing foreign exchange, but it did create a fair amount of hardships also for for people. Um, you know the bank nationalizations again that was more a government decision than an, but RBI uh, sort of was yeah. a party to that decision. Those are all. I think uh, decisions that over time we probably will look back on and say we would have done it differently. So you talked about demonetization, right? Recently, two thousand ke notes bhi band ho gaye. So two thousand ke notes kyu bandu hai? Kyu banay pehle? Kyu banay aur kyu bandu? Isliye banay kyunki it was easier to print them. Okay. If, if you have a certain time and government says we want to we want to be. able to demonetize as fast as possible remember you were going to demonetize the 500 and 1000 1000 rupees if you're going to demonetize as fast as possible how can you print enough notes hmm. by printing a large denomination <laughs> right so log keh rahe the ki aapne uh, 500 aur 1000 uh, note aapne band kiya aapne kyon 2000 ke note kyon print kiya hmm. isliye print kiya kyunki jaldi se print ho saka Uh, so that's why we printed 2000 so instead of printing 4 500 notes you could just print one and that exactly. would just make it because they about the same size yeah. and it takes exactly the same amount of work to print the 2000 now why were they removed i'm less sure of what the rationale was i mean it seems like if you did not want 2000 rupee notes you could just have uh, you know taken them out they get soiled over time don't print any new ones exactly. take them out you don't have to uh sort of declare an end to them i don't understand the decision maybe the government has a reason okay so there's no rationale which you can think about i can't think of an obvious rationale it seems to me that even if you want to end it you don't want any 2000 rupee notes because you think again they're being used for black money purposes just don't print any more hmm. because you're not you're not in any way withdrawing them you're just saying look you know stop using them and i will give you in exchange it's not like the it's not a demonetization like happened in uh, in uh, 2016 so 500000 ke notes was obvious that was sirf black money evade karne ke liye band hue the kyun band kare the like why would you <laughs> stop it i think you can speculate on the various reasons uh i think the primary reason for demonetization was always that there was a lot of this money being used to store black money hmm uh कि लोगों ने पैसे बनाए एंड दे डेंट वांट टू डिस्क्लोज इट टू द टैक्स अथॉरिटीज सो दे केप्ट इट इन द बेसमेंट इन द सेफ एंड द इजीएस्ट वे टू डू इट वाज इन थाउजेंड रुपी नोट बिकॉज दैट वुड टेक द लीज स्पेस आई मीन आई मीन थिंक वंस यू वंस यू आर थिंकिंग अबाउट अ लॉट ऑफ मनी इट टेक्स स्पेस ऑल्सो सो कीपिंग इट इन द हाइस्ट डिनोमिनेशन कीप्स एंड आई थिंक दैट that was one of the reasons people had 1000 rupee notes but also people had 1000 rupee notes because they feared medical emergency you know today you go with a medical emergency to a hospital they won't treat you unless you pay money pay, up front yes so if you say credit card they say we want out and many people don't have credit cards yeah so you have to keep money then some housewives were saving without their husband seeing it again in in large notes because easier to say, easier. easier to store yeah yeah easier to store so there was a lot of other uses also storage but storage for emergency purposes storage for see so when the notes were demonetized i think a lot of this came out but uh, the clever people who had it in black money found also some ways to bring it back exactly Exactly, a lot of people figured out uh, right. how to do it right. and how to get it right. exchanged and multiple right. things. Right. Do you think the whole purpose was not served? Just absolutely, I think the purpose was not served at all. 
the feeling was that if we demonetize a lot of people will declare their black money exactly and we'll get so much more in taxes mm. that didn't happen i don't think it happened at all in fact rbi has a number 99 point some 8% of the money came back without any anybody saying sorry hum paise hum uh, tax pay karenge 99.8% money came uh, back i i that point <laughs> a point, point will be more than 99% more than 99% came back <laughs> As 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 good as good as everything. As good as everything. तो वो हो जाता है वेस्टेज रेट हो जाता है वन परसेंट तो माइट भी माई फ्यू लॉस इन ट्रांसलेशन माई फ्यू वॉज मोर देन हंड्रेड परसेंट वुड कम बैक बिकॉज सम ऑफ द नकली नोट केम बैक एंड वर नॉट काउंटेड बट Fortunately, we did below nine a hundred percent. Well, uh, quick question on this: US has hundred dollar as the highest bill, yeah. right? Do you think कि बड़े नोट होना इकोनॉमी में अच्छा होता है या गंदा होता है Like What's the rationale? कि कुछ फर्क नहीं पड़ता I think there is an argument कि ये जो बड़े नोट्स हैं वो uh, गलत काम के लिए उपाय uh, इस्तेमाल होते हैं uh, You know, black money, drug money. Uh, terrorism activities and stuff. Terrorism like. activities less so. What terrorist has to pay ordinary people, so he needs smaller notes. <laughs> he can't pay in, but but generally capital flight, uh, you know, uh, black money storage, hmm. drug money. If uh, somebody, I think, once told me that if you check for cocaine traces, you can find much more on the hundred dollar note than on smaller notes. Similarly, Europe has a five hundred euro note. Switzerland had a 500 Swiss franc note. These are all ones where I think it's more used for storage, typically for storage where you don't want to account for the money. Then when you, so I think there is a rationale that you don't need it. But I think the best way to do it is by slowly withdrawing these high notes. The problem with the 500,000 rupee is it's being used for transactions. Exactly. Because by today with all the with prices where they are. Uh, you know i have a really thick wallet because it's full of 500 rupee notes if i had 2000 rupee notes it be a thinner not wallet thinner. Uh, and every time you take from the bank uh, you know even if you want to do a few days transaction uh, your wallet fills up so i i think if you think about where what is a 1000 rupee note is 12 dollars so it's not that much yeah uh, but uh, but that said i mean it the demonetization was what it was the uh, while you were uh, you were the governor at that time you worked with pm manmohan and you worked with pm modi both right uh, what were the like what were the strengths of both like why couldn't like yeah, what do you be, like about pm modi and what do you like about pm I'll, manmohan i'll be very uh, brief about this because obviously i don't want to talk too much about the personal sure. interactions i think Prime Minister Manmohan Singh obviously was an economist. He's an economist, and is a, a brilliant one. So he understands everything I'm saying about the economy, and he thinks very much along the lines of what I'm thinking. And I don't have to explain too much uh, on what we need. Where we, my job as RBI governor was to explain where we were in the economy and where we need to go. Um, I think. Prime Minister Modi is is extremely uh, alert and uh, and you know is a quick uh, read. So initially, again, I started by explaining where we were, etc. He asked questions, but he he got up to speed. And then uh, the discussions were you know after the initial discussions were more on the why are we doing this, why are we doing that, and should we do this, and should we do that. But both are, uh, you know, obviously very, very competent. Of course. Gentlemen. What's the strength? Like, what do you think is the strength of PM Modi, and what's the, what was the strength I, of PM? Well, Modi? now I'm going to step outside RBI because <laughs> I'm. Uh, this yeah. is not on, based on personal. I think True. he's he's an extraordinary politician. PM Modi. Yeah, uh, I mean he he has a sense of the pulse of the people, and he knows what makes them sort of. Um, He he knows how to convince people. Yeah, which he's a great is, persuader. He's a persuader. He he is an extraordinary politician. He makes people believe. That's so true. Yeah. Like it's it's you look at him and you read about him and the the way everything they've designed, it just makes you believe them much more. Well, yeah, uh, yeah I I think he's he's very persuasive. Now, uh, I I think. 
Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, I think, was extremely insightful into what he thought was needed. Mm. So that was his strength. He was uh, uh, more analytical. Mm. But obviously, Dr. Manmohan Singh is not a politician. Uh, you know, he was much more... An economist uh, than a politician. A, a technocrat, let me say. A technocrat. Technocrat, okay. Technocrat. But, I mean, it's not that he wasn't... You know, sometimes you get the sense that technocrat means somebody who is naive. Is not naive by any stretch of imagination. You couldn't have... Uh, worked in all the positions he worked in so successfully uh, without being really, really uh, able as, a, as an administrator. He's an able administrator, including, if you remember, the U.S.-India nuclear deal, which he pulled off. So I, I, I think uh, there's a lot in both men. In your book, there's one chapter which says India's engagement with the world. What is it about? Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to say is India has benefited tremendously hmm. when it has been open to the world, right? If we want to really um, sell our goods and services across the world, mm -hmm. we have to be part of global supply chains, whether they're service supply chains, whether they're manufacturing supply chains. We need foreign companies to come here and invest in India. We need to be able to sell our goods in the rest of the world. So closing down our economy is a bad idea. Opening up and engaging with the world is the right idea. I think one issue we need to keep also in mind, we are seen as a friendly country relative to, say, China. That is why the world is beating a path to our door. We cannot be seen as an ugly superpower. We cannot exercise our muscles before, you know, our time has come and even when our time has yeah. come we should be much more careful because we need to take countries with us rather than antagonize them and say you shall do this and I think we have to be so the Chinese have a term for their ugliness which is wolf warrior okay because you're flexing your muscles and saying <laughs> rest of the world be scared of us and that Bordeaux. causes a reaction mm. the US imposes tariffs because they're scared of China yeah the countries around China have disputes with them because they're scared of China. China's There's an Indian term which is now starting to emerge, tiger warrior, that we also have a bunch of people who say, ah, we're going to exercise our might in the rest of the world. First, it's too early. And second, it causes a reaction. Mm. Right? We don't want that reaction. It's better to be liked because they open their Those. trade their goods and services, their universities to us, to be disliked, to be put in the same category as China would mean we don't get the investment, we don't get the uh, the trade, we don't get the people. Yeah. How many people want to come to a country which is antagonistic with theirs? So let's be careful about that. So uh, giving it an example, let's say what we did with Canada recently, like we were too harsh, we should take a, like a lightened right. approach. No matter what the reality on whether Indian agents were involved, Indian government agents were involved in what happened, that's still a matter of debate. But the reaction to Canada saying you should not try and kill people on our soil hmm. was of huge indignation. And we, you know, to some extent, pushed back much harder yeah. Then when the U.S. said exactly the same thing and we were much more cooperative in listening to them, hmm. I think the issues are exactly the same. In fact, the people involved are exactly the same. But our two different reactions for two different countries uh, for two different countries suggest that perhaps we should be thinking what image are we sending across? Fair. Do you think the world order is going to change now? Is it, it coming? It has to. Yeah. It has to. The world war, the next world war is coming? Do you think that? I hope not. But I do think we should be prepared uh, for, for, you know, a possibility that, you know, China may act on Taiwan and uh, the Western world will push back. That is a possibility. Yeah. I, I don't think it's uh, when I talk to uh, uh, Chinese um, sort of uh, people, they say, no, 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 we're not going there. But who knows yeah. what compulsions? I mean, the problem with 
more authoritarian countries is it's all in the mind of the leader and you don't know what goes on in the mind sure. of the leader what my so you think the change of order will like the world order will change i think it has to simply because uh the rise of china the rise of india eventually the rise of brazil uh all these don't have a seat at the table china has india doesn't brazil doesn't uh on the other hand the uk and and uh, and uh, france have because they were the old powers so there will be have to be a reordering the other problem i think is the un is so weak yeah and so they can't even do you know uh, engage in in establishing peace for example in gaza and so we will have to think of how we create a stronger organization for global peace and the un at this point is totally emasculated uh, and which is also tells me that india getting a seat on the security council a permanent seat you know it's good for status but the un is a dysfunctional organization who, who which other three countries you feel can be like competitors to india in order to get the kind of recognition or the power that we have let's say if there's a new world order coming and right now who do you think has what are the top 3 countries who have a chance to be in this new world order look i i think china the, india china is of course uh, the us i think is not going to uh, go be left behind in any way hmm. uh, the us china european union may try and integrate much more yeah. and will be seen as more of a country if it goes that way so china india um, the european union Uh, the us but uh, also i think uh, indonesia is a country which is very populous uh, but which is also growing quite fast that is going to uh, over time be a a much more important player than it is now and then you look in other parts of the world certainly if uh, brazil um, you know gets its act with get a brazil is an incredibly um, sort of capable economy mexico because of its proximity to the united states uh, again growing fast but it has a huge problem with the drug uh, issue within uh, but even in africa nigeria is i mean some of my most spectacular students in class have been nigerian really they have really smart smart people uh, they have a very capable but again they held back by you know a government which doesn't work that well So I mean these are all possibilities there are other countries that are smaller than knocking on the door Saudi Arabia wants to exercise influence much more than uh, than uh, it has at present so we'll see a, a change so they so in right now if you have to look at let's say a close competitor to India that be only Indonesia no one I else. think in terms so in terms of population we are so much bigger than everybody yeah. else right the only country which is anywhere near our size is China, China. which is why everybody is looking for india as an alternative to plus china plus one yeah yeah um but i think that if you are willing to go down to 250 million then you're talking about country like <laughs> indonesia and you know they give so you talked about saudi arabia uh, i'll just wrap up like last two three questions because i know you have to leave but uh, so saudi arabia keeps going on and giving the speeches that we are going to be the new europe of the world right. do you think that'll happen they they have a mm. lot of money uh I with, don't know how well that money is is being spent. I I talked a lot with um you know well they're spending on football for sure. <laughs> well that's like, the issue right? China also <laughs> spent a lot on football but didn't actually get anywhere. And now they've cutting they're cutting back yeah. on all that spending. I think there's a lot of money available in Saudi Arabia right now and they're trying to figure out what their path for growth is. But you know going back to this this book it all comes down to the quality of your people and your assets uh we emphasize again we need to make a huge difference in education and healthcare to get many of our people to the level where they can get those spectacular jobs we talk throughout on how when we talk to entrepreneurs again and again in india they say we don't find people yeah when you talk to the saudis they want to do many of the industries that we already have a presence in no they want to do it in a big way but then you have to ask do they have the human capital to do that it and if you're spending you know 10 15 hours a week reading the quran in in school 
you're not spending enough time doing math and and so on so they have to change the nature of their curriculum because there was a lot more emphasis on that hmm. in the past they thinking of doing that but that requires a change in your whole government attitude and and i think they are energized about it but this is is basically saying to us we have a lot of competition also from the rest of the world as they change yeah and we better change also to in, to really focus on investing in our human capital we have cheap labor yes. we have a lot of population yes. and now we are we are not seen globally in good lenses it's mm-hmm. not that people see ki okay india se to bekar ho gaya ya kuch ho gaya right don't you think all of this should reflect that we should have a great manufacturing capabilities around the world uh like we are not the leaders in manufacturing yeah. still even yeah. though we have the largest population young people we have a lot of fdi coming in yeah. why do you think like we have still not become the top or not become the best in world for manufacturing when we can actually provide the cheapest in the world so that's actually a great question because uh if you compare sort of india with china china is is there right china yeah. is the manufacturing workshop to the world what did we not do exactly uh, what did china do and if you look at the details there are a few things which hit you very quickly one while we have a lot of people um we don't have a lot of well educated uh sort of high school graduates uh they are often uh moderately educated um the ones that 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 finish high school and are really good most of them don't want to work with their hands they go on to college and to university yeah and not all our university graduates are great i mean we, uh, we cite this survey from webox which says only 50% of our university graduates are employable so one is in china the level of education especially mass education was higher and many of those were willing to work with their hands once they left schools and so the quality of worker you got was very good today when mm. we talk to entrepreneurs in india they say we, we can't find workers yeah and that boggles the mind no when when we have so highly much skilled, population highly skilled workers we, is what what they mean is we can't find appropriately skilled workers right so we need to work on that we need mm. to have many more people graduating with decent high school education but also able and willing to work in factories right the factory job also needs to be made better that's another issue which we need to think about uh, the second thing is the rules and regulations we've always talked about the rules and regulations being on- onerous in india difficult to set up a factory i don't know what rules and regulations you have to go through to maybe this you didn't have to because this is relatively services not hit by all the other but now we do now we have now to go through now you bigger you have all the rules and regulations so we have to make it much more business friendly mm. and that is a problem in china what they did is they had the local government which wanted to encourage growth because often the local government uh, leader was promoted based on the growth he generated or she generated yeah. so they changed the rules to make it easier for the local businesses mm-hmm. to actually grow so that was another thing uh, uh, china did third thing china did which is going to be very hard in our democracy is they actually suppressed unions the unions were all uh, sort of uh, departments of the communist party and the communist party said you'll do what we say they suppressed the unions and they kept wage growth low mm. so workers were paid less than their productivity which of of course meant that firms were looking to hire a lot of them and they grew uh, much much faster uh, last thing that uh, the china did was it kept the exchange rate really low so chinese goods were seen as really really productive and put all these together they grew their manufacturing but who paid the price the price was paid by the chinese household because you kept the exchange rate rose low so they couldn't buy things things were much costlier in chinese in in china because you had to import some of the goods at oh. high cost they also didn't pay them enough so chinese households didn't make a lot of money so one one of the big di- 
uh, disparities between China and other countries is you look at the consumption levels, how much households buy and consume as a fraction of GDP, it's really low. Really? So, uh, yeah, it's much lower than a country at its level of per capita GDP. So, I think China right now is about 50% consumption to GDP. India's at around 60-65%. So, Interesting. if you're willing to pay the price, the Chinese model can work. <laughs> but it also is not, you know, the, it did some things which is hard to do in India. Yeah. It had a higher level of education that we can work on. But it also had much more decentralization of policy. Mm. We are a much more centralized country. And maybe that model has something for us to learn from, which is decentralization and more suitable rules and regulations. Don't kill the business with too many rules. Wait, uh, quick question. What do you think... America is a superpower right now. China is another in making. And then India is somewhere there. Like people are banking on India's growth for next 10, 20 years, right? What do you think? One, one thing, if you have to highlight, what is what did America do right to grow to where they are today? What did China do right? And what is India doing right? Okay. So, and the, talk, in fact, just make it interesting. Talk about one, one thing they did wrong as well. Okay. Um, I think, what the U.S. has done right is kept a relatively open economy, uh, open in many ways, and earlier, uh, you know, a little more willing to give freedom to businesses to grow and not put too many rules and regulations on them. What it also did early on is build fantastic universities which created the knowledge base yeah. that has powered the U.S. economy. I mean, look at all these spectacular companies, Google. Where did Google get its intellectual property from Stanford University? Take all the biotech that's happening around MIT, and you see that even today, it's being powered by the intellectual property it's creating. What China did uh, really uh, effectively was it experimented while setting policy in an attempt to generate growth. They used to have a term, we cross the river by feeling the stones. In other words, we don't put out regulation just like that and you know see what happens. We experiment with a certain change here, see if it works, then extend it more widely. Right. So, for example, the digital renminbi that they're thinking about hmm. spent a lot of time planning it, then rolled it out in a couple of cities. Now they're thinking of Expanding rolling it, it out more widely. Nationally, yeah. yeah. So that's how they, they have done policy. And it was very, very, uh, I think, with this decentralized uh, policy changes, which, ch which tailored the policy to the needs of a particular area. Mm -hmm. They were very effective in growing. I also mentioned some of what they did in, in holding back wages and all that. So they grew spectacularly fast. Uh, you know, we were the same per capita GDP as they were in the 1960s. Today, they're five times our per capita GDP. So they've done something right. We haven't done anything wrong. We just do haven't done anything as spectacular as they have. What has India done right? I would say, you know, certainly uh, what India has 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 done right, in some ways, is is it focused early on on higher education, maybe a little too early, but it built at a time when it didn't really need them. Spectacular engineering colleges like the IITs, strong uh, management schools like I the IIMs. It is now reaping the benefit of all those mm -hmm. by producing high quality students who want who the rest of the world wants. So that's that's the source of the services business. It started with the IT business. Remember the 90s, a lot of engineers going into IT yeah. and creating that business down a $250 billion business. But it's also migrated into other services like management consulting and so on. So that India did really well. Now you asked, what did each one do wrong? I think from the US, most recently, I think the US has become much more inward looking and has become much more protectionist. That to my mind, and it's also become much more um, 
directive in terms of policy government is interfering much more yeah. you know build this build that we're going to subsidize this we're going to subsidize that that i think is truly against the american spirit true and that is going to be problematic for them down the line because they found they spent too much on subsidizing chip chip factories and this and that the rest of the world may benefit we'll get cheap <laughs> chips but uh, they will have wasted a lot of money so that's mm-hmm. that's the downside for america for china my view is they're turning authoritarian at just the wrong time because for china it's reached near the frontiers of uh, of uh, of growth it used to be in catch up growth where it used to learn or steal ideas from the rest of the world and and grow but now it's reached near the frontier in many areas evs drones uh, yeah. uh, even ai and so further growth requires them to innovate and they've building out very strong universities they can innovate but the government is turning much more authoritarian and innovation and creativity doesn't happen in an environment which is so close which is which is closed right you need the freedom to do anything to create an irreverent irreverent podcast that yeah. people listen to and that is going to make a difference if you are too uh, directive so for example recently they shut down all tutoring services internet tutoring services because they were helping rich kids and said no 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 everybody has to be helped because you're giving an additional advantage to rich kids you cannot have tutoring services that you charge for really so that's the kind of government intervention which hurts their economic growth from india's perspective i think the mistake we're making is we're turning we're not recognizing that our strongest capability is in the area of services and that services means a lot of things it can mean high quality jobs uh, uh, it can mean even low quality uh, low skill jobs for example you know a waiter is providing a service if we expand the number of uh, of uh, restaurants in this country we will be creating a large number of jobs if we expand tourism today we get fewer tourists than singapore you know if we expand the number of tourists we will have a huge tourist industry which can create a lot of low skilled jobs employing people from agriculture so i think we need to be open to what has worked in this country and emphasize that rather than impose a vision of what where we want uh, the country to go which unfortunately i think tends to overemphasize manufacturing which is sort of the past rather yeah. than things like what you're doing i mean who would imagine a few years ago that you'd have a service which is reaching millions yeah and and it's a valuable service yep well you know on all three of them i want to add something because i was reading a while ago where for america elon musk said the same thing they said he said that america was always a nation of risk takers and now it's turning into a nation of regulators so america needs more risk takers less regulators not the other way like not the vice versa and that's exactly what you just mentioned as well then with china one of the again one of the billionaires from china now moved to us said the same thing anonymously on a podcast and uh, he just talked about this that now the government the central authorities is not able to understand how the young world and the young people need to grow like it was great at one point where they closed everything and they let chinese economy flourish and that's why that's why they are successful as well because they didn't let other competitors come in but now it's not going to work because you are not the second or the third or the fourth now you are the first and for first you need that freedom of expression and freedom of uh, innovation so that's going to work out and the third on uh, on india what did you say you talked about the the the, uh, the turning back the turning, turning ba- back the tourism clock. and services right yeah. uh, and so i was listening to again uh, i think it was one of the economists or i think someone like just important nri who was who was talking about economies uh, economy economics i didn't i don't know who and he said something very beautiful that india has created so much content mm. just like us mm. around the world to tell the world that india has arrived mm. so you need to invest mm. but india failed to deliver content on that you need to visit mm. 
like india has done a great job in making other people yeah. believe that it's india's time and now everybody need to invest in india need yeah. to grow but they fail to deliver that hey you can also visit a beautiful country right. and that's where the tourism is i i think that's important i think as much as i mean going back to the idea of uh, of soft power as much as beautiful landscapes and uh, incredible india uh, are advertising is also the people and the warmth and the love and openness Yeah. and i think it's it's a very important we don't lose that image also that we don't be seen as a hard country <laughs> as a country that is closed that is not inclusive we need to be seen as a microcosm of of global civilization we have every race every religion every language all of them reflected in this country i mean you have french in pondicherry yeah. you have uh, you know english in many places you have uh, tribal dialects of enormous variety um you have various ethnicities right in this country uh, you know somebody from the andamans looks quite different from somebody from uh, ladakh yeah. it's it's a huge diversity and and what we're saying is we look like the world we are the world come visit us True. i think that's a great message we shouldn't lose it okay last three quick question this is more like rapid fire uh, but okay So number one is how do we decide who will be on the face of note? Like in America, they keep changing the by the yeah. presidents, right? Uh, and in India, we have Mahatma Gandhi ji, but there's no one else. So how do we decide who will be on the note? We can't agree on anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, look, I, but I, who decide? Like I, it's been decided, and they just keep going on. Nobody can introduce new thing. Like what's I, the policy think, behind it? I think so. uh we did design some new notes but uh, in general the sense was you can tamper with the color you can tamper with the size but you can't tamper with the face because once you pick a face it becomes very very controversial right yeah. i mean ideally like the uk uh you would bring in sort of scientists uh social reformers um you know prominent historical figures women uh but we need some agreement right mm. uh nobody know, knows what ashoka look like how do you put ashoka and then there's controversy about whether you know he really committed genocide on the kalingas or not uh so i, I think with every person in history you pick up there will be some issue what is non controversial is per- perhaps scientific uh, minds homi baba for example uh perhaps we could bring some of those on the note uh there will be a lot of debate on who's more important who's less important and then yeah. once you open it up then everybody wants their political leaders uh on 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 the face so i, I think it's it's maybe just continue with mahatma gandhi and bring everybody else out in stamps <laughs> <laughs> fair what's the what is like what is the basic salary of an rbi governor and what are the perks you get i don't know what the current salary is it but at my the time, time it first. used to be 4 lakhs a year 4 lakhs a year a year okay uh, the biggest perk is the house okay you get like a really big house you get a really big house in a really uh, a few blocks away from dhirubhai ambani's house in uh, mumbai in mumbai on malabar hill okay uh, uh the i you know did a calculation at one point if we sold the house we lease it we don't mm. uh, we have a long term lease from the port authority uh we'd get about 450 crores and then we invest that and then i could pay the entire uh, top brass mm. of the uh, rbi their salary <laughs> uh, we just move into an apartment in there <laughs> but it's a it's a splendid house in a very nice what are place. the other perks you get you get a car you get uh, you get a lot of staff to maintain that house it's an old house so okay. it needs maintenance maintenance uh, it's and the car a, is like you get like a really fancy luxury no, car no, no, or no, just no. like <laughs> you you get a decent car but it's not and uh, you can't you can't you know get like a, a rolls royce or a mercedes yeah, or you can't in a poor country do that you should not do that so but for like for an rbi government do you think it's less or it's appropriate or small it's it's on par with the um you know secretary the i think i think it's on par with the cabinet secretary it's not it's what government officials get um you don't get the other perks that government officials get you don't get a pension 
uh, but you get i think medical facilities so post you retired you don't get pension i don't get a pension so what do you do after that like you have to restart your career again well because uh, with most, four lakhs you're not been able to like save a lot well the, the reason partly was most past rbi governors were um civil servants hmm. so they already got a pension from their civil service uh but there was one who wasn't and i won't name him but i thought it was appropriate the, the rbi in that case um you know uh because of his many years of service to the rpi and to the government that he should get a pension but uh but i think you know i don't i don't need a pension i have a full time job so i was young enough yeah. to go back to a job and uh and so that's it's not it's not my issue uh but again i think the rationale was you have another job before you come into the <coughs> rpi or mm. you were an rpi official actually only I think two RBI officials have been appointed governor, but but so you have an independent pension from somewhere. Got it. And uh, quick question: Would who do you think was the best finance minister of India, and why? You know, I think there is a tussle, in my view, okay, between Dr. Manmohan Singh and Mr. Yashwant Sinha. Uh, Yashwant Sinha from the NDA. Yeah. Manmohan Singh, of course, uh, from the early Congress. But why? Like, why? Give me one one reason well, why. Um, I think Dr. Manmohan Singh did the big liberalisation in the in the early nineties, ninety two, and and that was a time of tremendous uh, change. Uh, and I think you know it took that combination of Dr. Narasimha uh, Dr. Narasimha Rao. who facilitated the political environment and uh dr manmohan singh who laid out the specific reforms so i i think that was spectacular and it set the pace for growth subsequently i think mr yashwant sinha uh especially in the nda uh, second uh, under vajpayee mr vajpayee there was a period when you know reforms had been done the question is do we need any more mm. and he kept pushing he kept saying we're not done we need to do more and you know things like simplifying the tax system uh he pushed for privatization because he said you know we have too much of a you know uh, occupy too much position in the state uh you know maybe even privatizing the banks there are lots of ideas yeah. that were put out some stuck some there was pushed back because i mean to some extent he didn't get the same kind of political support uh that uh, dr manmohan singh got uh but i thought that there was a very innovative uh and uh, um you know uh period uh and you know in terms of just sheer uh, intellect uh, mr chidambaram uh, is also a, a a finance minister with uh you know who's done i think the dream budget during the the uh, coalition governments was under his time uh, but he would be another person who would be in the consideration fair all right we recently had a good fortune to speak to uh, yashwant sinha's son jayan sinha so, yeah yeah jayan and i went to iit together oh we so were you're a classmate we are classmates what was there are, in that batch tell are, me we are friends <laughs> uh, we are good friends we were we were on the same quiz team for iit delhi really uh, and uh, um, actually rajdeep sardes i just told me that they were on the op- opposing team <laughs> uh, when uh, no it uh, i mean jayant is extraordinary in terms of what he's achieved over time uh, hbs mckinsey yeah, uh, like omidya lots of lots exactly of everywhere he goes like just in sitting on top But these are the kinds of intellects that we need to keep and uh, and uh, you know generate intellectual property from india a lot of the book is about how do we become a superpower in ideas in creativity because for the next 25 years if we want to become a developed country yeah our current pace of growth is not enough true the kinds of jobs we are creating is not enough we need to become an ideas superpower a creative superpower and for that we need to really work from today in making that possible 100% and i think that's happening it's just 
it i think with conversation like these we just need to accelerate that more with the books like these we need to accelerate that even faster but it's already happening the seed has been sown exactly so the book is all about examples of how indians are already doing it how do we multiply that 10 100 1000 times that's really the the question well question of the day we have lot of finance influencers in the world who give finance tips and their influencers but we want it from the og <laughs> why don't you give us uh three finance tips you would want to give to every young person who's watching this well uh, and it are, can be personal two, or two, it can two, be like on a broader very, person two are very obvious right okay. one is it's never too early to start saving okay right and and i'm not say, saying saving to uh just you know hold it hmm you may find the opportunity to start a venture to become an entrepreneur having some money of your own is is always useful savings give you independence give you peace of mind yeah spending uh gives you personal <laughs> satisfaction but it also puts you in a greater sense of stress so spend what you need to you know have a good life but where you can try and save and sometimes for young people there's so many ways of saving if you just spend a little more time researching certain you know products or certain things do i really need this but can i use that so that's one the second is in your investments you absolutely must diversify mm. right don't don't put it all in one cryptocurrency and hope <laughs> that's going to make your life it could also ruin your life so diversify your investments you don't need to be in the safest stuff because you're young you can take a few losses but you need to be reasonably diversified because otherwise you're taking on too much risk in any one investment. Is so, there a split you should people should follow between the risky and non-risky? You know, if I, I mean certainly uh I think the um having enough for your next year in the <laughs> non-risky is a good a good idea. Yeah. Uh to pay your rent, <laughs> to uh to pay your to EMIs, your bills, yeah. Uh that's that's useful. and what you don't need for some time put it in the riskier asset because then you have a chance of of seeing right. it grow too many indians i know have never invested in equity and that has served them poorly because the equity markets have done that really so well, well. And, and the third i think is you know for financial security ultimately what helps is a good good job and a good job comes if you constantly improve yourself and the second thing that uh, that helps in a good job is keep challenging yourself when your existing job you're not learning anything more often it signals it's time to move on move to something else which is going to give you you know a fresh set of challenges yeah. you may feel uncomfortable i mean we always love comfort i know everybody in this office i know how to do my work everybody respects the work i do but you're not growing yeah and so keep challenging by keeping on moving and uh moving when you need to i think that that would uh, that is more important than that, just moving yeah. haywirely yeah yeah move move to look for new better more interesting experiences i think all three are useful in my view thank you so much it was pleasure having you here i wish i could speak to you for another 5 hours but we don't have that much time one day we'll have you again and probably i'll fly down to where you are and then we'll try to do this again we'll dive deeper into into the economy indian growth and lot of stuff i have lot of ideas through my podcast i would love to share them with you and then you can give your two cents and make us Let's, uh, feel let's, more enlightened as well. Let's stay in touch. Thanks very much for having me, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Before we end this show, I want to thank each and every one of you, because of you guys, we have come really far. Today, it's it's an honor that we have gotten one of the biggest economists in the world with us. Doctor Raghuram Rajan came here because of the constant support that you guys have shown us. I just want to say thank you. I don't have any ask today. I don't want you to share, like, subscribe, do anything. Just want to share my gratitude because the way you guys have supported us is more than enough. Thank you so much. I'll keep trying to bring these kind of episodes and try to get better and better guests for you so that you can become a better leader for this country.
until the next episode keep figuring out